Hi everyone, it's Joe here from Lawn Solutions Australia and today I'm lucky to be joined by a very familiar face for a lot of you and a familiar face for us, our friend Jason Hodges. Hey Jason. Joe, hi everyone. We're here in um, beautiful Berry on the south coast of New South Wales which is Jason's new home, my home as well. So Your old home? That's my new home, my current home. No, you moved to Bombardier. No, I didn't. Not yet. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it's a beautiful day here, we're on Jace's farm. What do you got about? You got about 300 square metre farm here, I think, isn't it? 300 square metre. No, this is uh, 4.2 acres of the most productive land on the south coast. <laughs> so uh, we'll get into this a little bit later on, but you, you're growing a couple of plants here, I see. Uh, yeah, it's called Bucks' Balls of Berry, uh -huh. and it's uh, it's a joy. It's a joy. We'll come back a little uh, to that a little bit later, um, but while we got you here, let's circle right back. Um, I guess a lot of people want to know how you got to sort of where you are today, how the journey went. Where did it all start? Uh, you obviously didn't just jump straight onto a TV screen. Uh, you had to start and build your way up from, from somewhere. So how did this journey start? Um, when I was seven years old, I, uh, I said to my parents I wanted to be a landscaper. Um, and they thought I wanted to be a farmer, but I just didn't realise it was landscaper. Uh, both my sisters were florists. My brother had become a horticulturist. Mum and dad were keen gardeners and just sort of combined all their jobs. And, and the journey into <laughs> landscaping, you uh, did your apprenticeship, you went the normal sort of way into that, did you? Or you sort of started roughing around and doing cashies and found your way into it later? Or oh, there's, that there's no cash at all in the economy, <laughs> which is a real shame by the time I started working. But um, no, look, I did a lot of work with dad when yep. I was at school, just like mm -hmm. you did with your parents. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had basic skill set by the time I'd finished school. Yep. Uh, I started a lawn mowing run as soon as I got my driver's yeah, right. license. Yeah. Uh, I had about 40 lawns when I was in year 12, so yeah. I didn't do much studying. Um, and then, yeah, enrolled in TAFE and did the course at TAFE and never did a formal apprenticeship, but did an apprenticeship as in learned bricklaying from dad, yep. uh, learned fencing and decking and timber work from a, a man named John Doyle. Uh, and learn horticulture through my brother and my sisters. But TAFE was an important sort of, if, if you're only going to learn from one person, you're only ever going to be a poor example of that person. Mm -hmm. But if you combine the education, which I took serious compared to school, yep. uh, and then the uh, information that I learned from those mentors, Dad and Mr. Doyle, um, yeah, I think I did a really good apprenticeship in my way. It's funny you talk about TAFE now. We, um, we've done a little bit of work lately, and you actually give quite a lot back to the new TAFE students now, and you you put them on a pedestal, which is nice. Uh, at Mifkus this year, we did a bit of a tour with the TAFE kids, so you see that as a pretty important part of, of what you did. I remember when I left TAFE, I tried to join the Landscape Association of New South Wales, mm. and it was something like, and this is early 90s, it was like $3,000 to join. Yeah. And I thought, that's not inclusive, that's for big business. Yeah. And so I'm always, and, and it's a smart thing to do with business anyway. If you if you can influence, so I still go to the same nurseries. I still buy my pavers from the same people, mm. my sand and soil, my turf yep. from the people that I bought it with when I was 20 years old. So it's smart for businesses like Lawn Solution or a nursery or a, a turf supplier or a material supplier to look after those kids. Yep. And then, then it's inclusive and then they're your next leaders and then mm. they're the next people who are going to put on apprentices. Yeah. And the smarter our industry is and the more it's um, prestigious, mm. the better jobs you get, the more people spend on their garden. Yep. Like a generation ago, you'd never borrow money to do up your garden. You'd borrow your money to buy a car or your kitchen or your bathroom, but you'd just do the garden on the weekend. So like 40, 50 years ago, there wasn't a trade for landscapers. It only happened in the 80s that it started being a trade yeah, that right. you went and studied. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm all for it. And the 40 kids that went down to Mifkus this year yeah. and we gave them a shirt and yep. a book and, awesome. and had a chat to them, like there's 60 going next year. Yeah. And so, and that's just one region, which is our region here. It's important to look after your backyard. Mm -hmm. But there's 60 people that are going to think, I'm a good bloke, so I've conned them. But, <laughs> Poor no, but like um. hopefully they get the hand up that I got from – you know, I still call him Mr. Doyle, the man that helped me. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, it's important. No, it's awesome that you do that. And we think it's great here too. That's why we try and help you support it where we can. And so moving on from TAFE, uh, you started working, you started getting some clients and you started your own business. Uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, Green Art. So I called it Hodges Landscapes to start and then I got the job on TV and I realized that I was getting phone calls from Perth and Adelaide. Yeah. And so I changed it to Green Art. Yeah. At its biggest, I had about 11 staff. Um, did some pretty good jobs, did a lot of work for uh, Jamie Jury before he was on television, which was an insight into how that kind of world worked. Yeah. Um, grew up in Willoughby, which is the working class suburb of the North Shore, so surrounded by suburbs with money. 
Um, so yeah, worked uh, North Shore uh, up to sort of Pimble. Yeah. Um, never really travelled too far from work. I, I learned early from Dad. He had a HQ Ute that he had for thirty years that never crossed the Harbour Bridge. Yeah. So why pay two dollars to go to work? And it kind of makes sense. <laughs> Um, so yeah, tried to work at home or, or close to home as possible and didn't want to take over the world, was just happy with my lot. Um, in 1999, I got asked to do a TV show and I said, no, I wanted to play football. And I was one of those young, dumb people that still played football at the time. Yeah, idiots. You still play football? No, no I'm yeah. smarter than that. Um, and I said no. And then uh, he goes, I'll give you a $1,000 a day. And I said, well, I'm not going to make that playing football. <laughs> so I retired from football. And, uh, yeah, that was the – I was 26 years old when I got the job on TV. So that was um, where I was leading to next. I know a lot of the people watching this at home are probably thinking how a head like that gets on TV. But let's um, – must be the good look at the boys' charm. So you got your start from there. And then things sort of built. What show did you actually start on? I started a show called Auction Squad. And it was a little similar to the time at the moment where there was a massive boom in the real estate industry and uh, houses were sort of doubling in price in a year or two. We'd go to houses that couldn't sell um, and say the reserve was 400000 they didn't get a bid. We'd spend $15,000 on them and then put them back to auction and they'd get five hundred and five fifty right. and six hundred. Right. We yeah. look like geniuses. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, the, the fourth series, the economy had slowed down and the real estate boom was over. And uh, I think we sold two of the 20 houses we did, where the first year we sold all of them. And uh, I thought my time was up. I got a phone call at 9 o'clock in the morning saying, uh, Auction Squad's not going ahead next year. I went, oh, okay, fair enough. That was fun. I got something to show the grandkids. And then at lunchtime, I got a phone call saying, oh, you got a job on Better Homes and Gardens. Is that easy? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I did Better Homes and Gardens for 16 years. Yeah, wow. Well, no, it was a, you did a great job on that show and I think it still tests now. Uh, you finish on that show now, but people are always coming up to you and, and saying how much they loved you on Better Home. So it's a credit to how well you presented on TV and the work you did. And moving on from TV now, we find ourselves in, in God's country, in Bury, New South Wales. And you got a, a happening little nursery here. I won't even say little anymore. It's quite a big nursery uh, you got growing down here in Bury. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your Bucks' farm and the other plants you sell and, and how things are going for you down here? Yeah, well... For starters, I've always been like Jack the Lad. Like, you know, people think, oh, it just happens or whatever. But I've always had little goals. Yep. So I started coming down here long before I knew Lawn Solutions, which is based here. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents' best friends lived here. Yep. And so I knew the area really well. But then I started coming down as an adult again to film stuff for Lawn Solutions. And I'd film on a Tuesday or a Thursday or whatever it was. And then I'd say, oh, can I film on the Friday? Because I want to stay the weekend. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and then I found this block of land and um, started coming down every weekend and then fell in love with it and mm -hmm. planted a few bucks, which I thought that I'd just put into my own jobs. Yeah. And the first year I put 500 in. And a buxus is just a hedge plant that, you know, isn't anything special when it's just a hedge. It's like any other hedge. But if it's a ball or a cone or a spiral or a cloud tree, there's a lot of time that goes into it and yep. it sort of raises its value. Mm. Um, so I started mm. growing bucks of spoils of berry. Uh, first year I put in 500, the second year I put in 200, and then I didn't put any in for a couple of years just to wait because they're slow growing. Mm -hmm. If I had have put them in in the third and fourth year, I'd be going much better <laughs> yeah. than what I am today yeah. Yeah. because it's like putting a share away for 10 years and then it comes back and it's worth something. Mm -hmm. So now we've got nearly 7,000 in the ground. Wow. Um, the goal is to sell about 2000 a year, yeah. um, so which is only 40 a week. It's a lot of joy and a lot of fun. Um, it frees up your time. It's not like you have to be a bricklayer and you're laying every brick so you're at work every mm -hmm. hour of the week. Mm -hmm. um, if I want to go to Sydney for the day or if I want to have the day off, they're still going to grow. Yep. They get watered and the sun shines and you know, we've got beautiful soil and yeah. great climate here. Yep. Absolutely. So I... A little bit of it was luck, yeah. but uh, it was always a plan to live here by the time I was 54. Yeah. Uh, it just come a little bit earlier, but I'm not complaining about that now. Earlier? Yeah, well, I'm only 21. Yeah, 21, I thought so. Um, so people can follow along at home on Instagram with, with Jason's Instagram page, but I see it up close, but you can see it on Instagram and by talking to people, the business has grown quite a lot. You sell boxes pretty much everywhere now, don't you? Yeah, the majority of it goes to Victoria. Yeah, so um, lucky that like a few of Australia's best garden designers who I have relationships with or friendships with um, have really sort of brought into it because it's pretty easy to go just to one wholesale nursery and say I want 10 roses 
you know, 10 lily pillies and 10 boxes. Yeah. You know, and, and that's how an average landscaper would go and buy their plants. Mm. But the high end guys, they go and find the growers and they get the best stock. Mm -hmm. And so they go, I want to get the roses from David Austin. I want to get my lily pillies from the native expert. And I want to get my boxes from Jason. Yeah. So, yeah, I quite often have, um, you know, a semi trailer load going to Victoria to fill mm -hmm. a job for Paul Bango or Miles Baldwin. Yeah. And literally, they're the two best known garden designers in Australia. Yeah, cool. So, if I keep them happy, then I'm happy. And while we're here, we've got to talk about the fleet. Uh, so, you got Bucks' number plates on how many different cars now? Two different cars? I've got two. <laughs> they are different. And half of Barry thinks that I've duplicated the same number plate. <laughs> so, I've got BUXUS, which yeah. is Bucks's. Yeah. And I've got BUXU5. Right. And you'd have to look closely to see the fives, yeah. not an S. Yeah. So, yeah, there's lots of people in town that think I'm breaking the law. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I've got a soft spot for cars, sand shoes, and watches. Right. Watches are a lot easier to stack up than yeah. uh, sand shoes. Yeah. And uh, a lot easier to park than cars. Well, it's a bit of a hit in the main street, the Bucks are huge. It's always there. You're always at the back. I like the little old Land Rover that I drive yeah. around in. It, yeah. uh, it was funny that. It cost me eighteen hundred dollars to buy that car, mm. and the rule is that I'm not allowed to drive it into town without Buxus on the back, like a little bit of marketing and advertising. Yeah. The first day that I drove into town, I sold eighteen hundred dollars worth of Buxus. <laughs> paid for so the car. It paid for itself the first day. <laughs> Red Joe, not so much, but it paid yeah. for the car. Yeah. yeah. And then, so we'll give people a little bit of a tour of the Buxus farm throughout this, but let's talk about uh, grass uh, because obviously your our office is based here in Berry, and you're here in Berry too, so we have quite a good working relationship, but. It blossomed many years ago. Um, it started many years ago, still blossoming now. But how'd you get into, obviously you got into turf through landscaping, but how'd you get into firstly the Sawalta brand and now Lawn Solutions Australia? How'd that relationship start? All right. So firstly, one of the reasons I became a landscaper was because way back in the day, North Sydney Oval was across the road from my school. And it was a really crappy footy field that no one wanted to play on. And there was a politician named Ted Mack. And he was an independent and he did up North Sydney Oval to the beautiful ground that is today. Right. And they returfed it and they put a picket fence in and they bought the bob stand from the SCG and they made it look old. North Sydney Oval isn't old, yeah. but it looks old. And I thought, wow, if you can do that there, and that was like my playground. Mm -hmm. If you can do that there, you can do that in backyards. And then I was a dummy at school. Like I really enjoyed school and sport and playground, but you know, Napoleon didn't interest me and, you know, whatever that chart is you learn in science and stuff like that. So I learned more on the backyard lawn at home with mum and dad, mm -hmm. whether it be looking after your dog or your golf swing or how you tackle or play cricket or, you know, knocking the lemons off the tree, whatever it was, it was always on the backyard lawn. Yeah. And so the lawn to me is really iconically Australian. I didn't go to the beach. I was a little fat kid. I can't ride a horse. I'm not a cowboy. Yeah. And they're the two things that we sell to the world. Mm -hmm. But the reality is your backyard is most kids Australia. And so I remember that vividly and I've always loved it. Mm. And then putting it into gardens, I've always built practical gardens that families could live in. Like even if it was a show garden at Chelsea or down in Melbourne, I never built this garden that like was unrealistic. I always built backyards that had, you know, the fire pit or the swimming pool and it always yeah. had a big lawn. Mm -hmm. So back in about 2004, five maybe, I was building a beer garden up in the Hunter Valley yeah. and I really liked Sir Walter and I always used turf which was out at Windsor. Mm -hmm. But because I was up there, I rang the local bloke and he turned up and he had this massive truck with this sign writing. Turf back in the day used to get delivered on the back of a open truck and you'd throw the turf on the ground. He had a forklift and I was impressed and started chatting to him. And it was Brent who started Sir Walter in his back paddock. And I thought he was just a truck driver. I still think he's just a truck <laughs> yeah. driver. And um, he said, oh, do you mind if I come back this afternoon and show you something? I chatted to him about what I was doing and what he was doing. And he brought back what was the first wedding agent I'd ever seen yeah, right. with a water crystal in it. Yep. And he was doing a test on some grounds on the central coast and one field needed half the water of the other field. And I thought, this guy's not just a turf grower. Yeah. He's really smart. So I asked him if he wanted to sponsor a garden at the Melbourne Garden Show. And that was in 2004 because my goal was to not just be 
Jack the Lad on TV. Yep. I wanted to prove to people that, oh, yeah, he's a nice, mm. likable bloke, mm. but he actually can it's compete with this. the best. Yeah, sure. So I built this garden, put a big lawn in. Um, there was 12 gardens that year, and I was the only one with a lawn. Right. And I won a gold medal. Yep. And then the next year, every garden had a lawn mm -hmm. in it. And I would pretty much comfortably say now, nearly 20 years later, that 95% of the show gardens would have a lawn yeah. in it. Yeah. Um, Melbourne had a very harsh drought compared to um, the rest of Australia. Like mm -hmm. Sydney has a green drought. The yeah. lawns are still green, but the dam might be low. Mm -hmm. But Victoria, like even the weeds weren't growing. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I really like the fact that I put turf on that stage and – those designers now use turf yep. and getting an opportunity with you guys. Like I remember when I spoke to Gavin Rogers and said, Oh yeah, look, I'd love to be an ambassador. Mm. And he goes, Oh, we're going to um, America in about four weeks time. I said, okay, well I'll pay my own way and go mm. because I was invested in it. I loved it, but I didn't know, like I taught turf establishment at TAFE and I said, all right, kids, green side up, water the shit out of it and you'll be right. <laughs> Yeah. If you know the difference between Kokuyu, Keech and Buffalo, you'll pass. Yep. Because yep. that's how complicated it was yep. back then. Where now with the varieties and I was lucky enough to do that America trip mm -hmm. and then I went to Vietnam as well. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like my knowledge is nowhere near what a turf farmer or greenkeeper is, mm -hmm. but I can confidently talk to any landscaper or home owner or garden designer yep. and recommend what I know. Um, will work and yep. sometimes you say no put a garden bed in there well yep. that's where you put the path yeah because it's not the answer to every question but i guess as a landscaper having um exposure to the technology in turf and the different varieties that are available um we'll talk about tip tough and sagrange now for, for starters but as a landscaper it used to be oh, i'll just put buffalo in the backyard but now you can create different looks and different finishes with these different turf products yeah i remember the big change in my opinion of turf was I used to make phone calls just to get the cheapest price. Yeah. So, and it was really important to me in my early 20s. Like if it was, you know, $5 here and $5.50 there and I was getting 100 metres, it's $50. Mm -hmm. You know, that was that was a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and then I was on the phone one day, said, mate, just come out and we'll show you our quality. Yeah. He bought me a can of lunch at the pub. It was about six bucks. It was the best six bucks he ever spent. Yeah. <laughs> so I bought turf off him for 25 years. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you're a landscaper, if you're even if you're a homeowner, mm. most of the turf farms have got plots that you can go and look at. I know yes. you guys do. Mm -hmm. But just to see the love and care and the brains that goes into growing mm -hmm. these weed-free to type, which is the DNA certified part mm. of it, and to deliver a quality product that's never been touched by hand. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like all these things where even when I I say a generation ago, but mm. it's only 20 years ago, that was cut with a thing that looked like a mower. And someone else was behind it rolling it up. Then mm. they're throwing it on the truck. Mm. Then they're driving around in the full sun. Then they're throwing mm. it on the ground at the other end. Like the quality has gone from, yeah, it looks like grass and it's really good, to it looks like the best carpet you've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. Now the technology's come a long way, not just on the varieties <coughs> end, but on the harvesting and the growing. Yeah. And like you said, the first person to touch the grass now is a customer, which is a pretty cool thing. So I spent a day harvesting with you once. It wasn't a day. You added three Cokes and four pies by nine o'clock. Yeah. And we didn't even finish the day. You had to conk out early. That's you know? funny. You were driving the tractor watching the IPL in uh, England. <laughs> Don't tell the boss that. <laughs> um, and when it comes to turf now and the new technologies available, obviously you've been a Sir Walter man for a long time now, but what do you think of the new ones that are out there on the market? When you see Tiff Tough that's been looked after, mm -hmm. um, and it, it is the idiot proof version of having a cooch, yeah. it is 10 out of 10. And I'm in love with Grange because I love what you can do with it, where you can mow it short and you can leave it long mm -hmm. and you can really create a point of interest by having mounds of it and things like that. So Walter's still like the, and this has not been um, dismissive of it, it's like the really solid meat and three veg. You know what you're going to get. What? Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, thought you, food. I thought I was going to get bad press or something. <laughs> no, like you know what you're going to get. If you're a fastidious lawn person, you're going to have a great lawn. Mm -hmm. If you mow the lawn every week or two in summer and once a month in winter and you feed it once a year mm. and you might water it when it's like really dry, yep. you're going to have a pretty good lawn. Mm -hmm. And if you mow it once a fortnight and you never feed it and water it, well, it's probably the only lawn that's going to exist. Yep. So you know what you're going to get. Tiff Tough, if you fall in love with it, you can have a bowling green. Mm -hmm. And so Grange, like I said, I like how you can cut it at different heights. A really good trick is if you've got trees in the lawn, 
because it'll grow to about 150 mil. Um, you can ha leave big rings around the which can grow with the tree. So oh, if you yeah. plant a small yeah. tree that's, yeah. you know, four foot tall and has got a trunk on it this big, you can not mow this far around it so you're not damaging the trunk. Yep. And you get this really nice contrast. It kind of looks like Mondo grass or yep. Liriope or something like that. Yep. And as the tree gets bigger, you just mow further out. So yeah. on a rural property around here, those big rusty rings or a ring of brickwork, which is going to move when the roots grow anyway, mm. you, they might cost you $1,000 a tree. Yeah. Where with this, you've got something that can grow with the tree yeah. and it's easier to mow. and Keeps the weeds out. Yeah. It yeah. looks fantastic. Yeah. So they, they've all got their place. Yeah. Um, the best thing about it is when I was a kid, you'd roll around the lawn, you get all hot and itchy because it wasn't soft leaf buffalo. Yeah. So kids these days, they don't know how good they've got it. But no, I'm still in love with all of them yeah. and I recommend all of them for different things. Yeah. Uh, it just means that you can answer more questions because there's more choices. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, it's it's, it's not just one size fits all. Yeah. Um, they can really have a look at them, uh, see what suits their needs and they can choose from there. But great to chat, great to catch up. People have seen you for many years now, but I suppose they get a, a, a good glimpse into what you're doing now. You're running a, a very successful Buxus business, plant nursery down here that they can check out uh, on your Instagram page. I'm sure if they search Jason Hodges. Jason probably... Hodges and Co, I think it is, yeah. Jason Hodges and Co. Very nice. But, Dan, um, Danny's the Co. Danny's the Co. <laughs> <laughs> Danny's still How old is Danny now? Still going strong. Danny turns 15 in March. Danny turns 15. Going she's, well. She's fit and well. Yep. It's funny. I always think she's deaf, but if yeah. you go and open any packet in the kitchen, <laughs> she'll come from 50 metres away. Yeah, yeah. No, she's little. as good as gold. Oh, very good. Well, um, we mentioned briefly the Bucks's farm before. What do you say we go and check out and show the view? How many you want to buy, mate? Me? Can't afford them. <sighs> so this is where all the magic happens. Now, I think most of these are Bucks's, aren't they? You've got a bit of everything here, but the Bucks's balls. So these ones here yes. uh, that we're seeing that are about, what do you call them? 500 mil. 500 hand. mil balls? Yep. How long would that take you to grow? From so a about four years in the ground. And then I try and have it in the pot for 12 months before I sell it. And how often are you shaping them and cutting them? And Two to three times in the growing season and probably one other time in the year. So between September and March, probably two to three times. Yep. And then maybe in the middle of the year, just sort of some straggly bits that are popping out the side. And they're 500 mil balls. This thing here. Yeah. How big is that? That's oh, about 1.5 and there's another one behind it that's a standard. So. And that's been here how long then? Uh, they were salvaged out of a demolition job. Okay. So that's a good way to get them. Yeah. Um, it doesn't always work out. So you look at people's hedges. People send me hedges all the time and say, yeah. are you interested? Yeah. But people plant them about this far apart. Mm. So the hedge might be this big, but the plant's like right. a slice of cheese compared yeah. to a block of cheese. Yeah. But yeah. they were individuals in a garden and I had plenty of time. So they're worth keeping and, and restoring, just like yeah. recycling timber or bricks or whatever. You know, I can feed them up, make them look fresh and new yep. because of their size. They'll be worth a fair bit. And then these are called cloud trees. These so, ones? Yeah. So yeah. you just grow a single leader, which is the, the trunk in the middle. Yeah. And you let them grow like there's 400 of them in there. Yeah. And then you pick them out and you just take off from a lot of the foliage. Yeah. And then you just start creating individual balls. Yeah. And they're um, highly desirable as sort of feature trees on front verandas. And um, So how long is that ready before sale? They've got a ball up and they're shaped. They've got a ball up. They're probably 12 months away. Yeah. Um, that's been in the ground for 10 years. Yeah. And wow. And you're probably looking at a couple of thousand dollars wholesale. For me? Probably about a couple of thousand dollars wholesale. <laughs> <laughs> You're no good with bucks, mate. No, 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 no. I gave him two for his wedding. You killed him. Yeah, killed him. Marriage is going all right, yeah, It's going well. <laughs> um, and so a common order, like what, what would people generally order? Like these, these bigger gardens you're talking about, would you do put five into a big garden or would you put 20 or 30? Or? So when I started, they yeah. were very much just like one either side of the front stairs yep. or the front veranda. Yeah. Um, and I would have said they were like the Rolex of plants. So mm -hmm. the rest of the garden can be easy care, low maintenance and, and cheaper plants. Yep. And then you put the really showy things right where you Pizza. see it. Yep. Um, but now really common garden design and uh, I, I always liked it and did it myself, but it's become much common is sort of having uh, mounds of them. So you've got okay. small and medium and large and yeah. you create a whole garden bed of them. And, yeah. and I've put hundreds of them into jobs at times. Yeah, wow. Okay. You know? So it's yeah. a really, that's a, a yeah. enjoyable thing. Yep. Funny little story. But biggest delivery ever at the time went to Raglan Street in Mossman on the North Shore of Sydney. 
And we used to go on a school walkathon, and I'd go past this house. So I'm talking, I'm 10 years old, 11 years old, and 12 mm. years old. Mm. And I can remember stopping at the gate of this property and looking in, and it looked like a wonderland. And it was all buxus and hedges and balls. And I remember going to my mate, look at this garden. And he went, oh, you're a sissy. You like gardens. I'm 30 years later, I'm driving to Mossman to do this big delivery, and it's Raglan Street. And I go, geez, I hope it's near that place. So yeah. I'll, I'll stick in my head at the gate again and have a look. And it was that house. It was that house. And I can remember the hair on the back of my neck sticking up. I'm like, went inside and I'm telling the homeowners. Yeah. I was more excited about their house than they were. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was my biggest order at the time. Yeah. And uh, I've been back a whole heap of time and yeah, cool. just give them a little bit of advice. It's yeah. really just me to go and check on my babies. And and as a, we'll call you a farmer, won't we? As a farmer. Struggling farmer. Struggling farmer. What's the, what's the inputs needed to get these to where they are now? Obviously, we're in beautiful growing conditions, good soil, good rainfall and that sort of thing. This is a very fertile floodplain. Yep. It was a cow paddock for 100 years, so it's been topped up with manure for yep. 100 years. I, When it was a weekender, I'd put them in the ground, water them well, and hope they were there the next week. Yep. I tried to do this in the Hunter Valley beforehand, and the extremes of weather, hot and cold, yeah. um, I'd, I'd had no success. Yep. And down here, this makes me look very smart. Yeah, right. And it's really the environment and the ground. Yeah. Um, we live 800 metres up the road, uh -huh. and it's a much harsher condition than just here. Yep. Yeah. So right. it's, you know, perfect. I mean, how many turf farms are on the side of a hill? Yeah, not many. Yeah. Yeah. But it does well here. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it's, it's an amazing part of the world, the south coast of New South Wales. And what else are you growing? So it's not just boxes. I see. Everything else is for fun. That's that's a frangipani. Frangipani. Yep. So we've gone into frangipanis yep. purely because a friend was knocking down to build a garage. Yeah. And I hate things like that getting mulched. And, sure. Yeah. You know, whether they're sellable in the future or put them into my own garden or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. uh, everything else is a distraction. It sounds funny. Yeah, it's okay. like yeah. um, we get the kids to do the, the licorice plant, mm -hmm. which is really cool, and they ball up quite sim quickly. Yeah. Um, but it's really bucks us. So one of the things I learned, is, I learned it through Sir Walter actually, is like branding's really important thing. So mm -hmm. you get brand recognition, but with that, you don't get the pollution of other people doing poor things. So when you talk about Sir Walter, people know that it's a great product and it's got, I know that the Lawn Solutions Group have got great pre and post sales reps that yep. answer the phone, help you with your problems. So this is Buxus Japonica. Mm. Those darker green ones over there, yeah. they're Buxus Japonica Faulkner. And as far as I know, I'm one of about two people growing them. Okay. And I really love them. Yeah. There's not a huge market for them yet yeah. because people will already have buxes in their house or in yeah. their garden. Um, so I'm really enjoying growing that and educating some designers mm. and some landscapers about this plant that's the same but better. And that's exactly what I think of Sir Walter. There's yeah, okay. a lot of soft yeah. leaf buffaloes, but it's better. Yeah. So if I can supply them with great stock and then back it up in the future with them being rewarded with a great plant mm -hmm. and then wanting more and then I'm the only one that's got them at a certain size. Yep. I've created my own market, which sure. is what you know, Sir Walter's done. It's it's you drive around, you see a house for sale, and it'll say Millet Kitchen, um, our fresco dining, Sir Walter Lawn. Yeah. You know, you wouldn't have you would have just saw a big backyard twenty yep. years ago. Yeah. yeah so it's right. it's important that people have the knowledge, they want to know where their steak comes from and where their veggies come from. Mm. And if they know that they've got a particular plant or a particular lawn, it it sells it better mm -hmm. and they're rewarded for buying the better product. Yep. And so wait for the Faulkners. Wait for the Faulkners, right? They might stay alive at my place. And so how many plants in total, did you say? We've got between there? six and 7,000 at any one time. And is there much mechanics involved or a lot of this is done by hand? Uh, most of it's done by hand. Yeah. So. I think every person that's followed me on Instagram or knows me has sent me the little video of the machine that mows, I've uh, seen it. That yeah. prunes the bucks yeah. automatically. Uh, I've got one of them. Her name's Lisa. <laughs> she's she's, actually, working, over she's working over there while we're yeah. talking here. Yeah. Um, in the ground, we prune with uh, Husqvarna or Ryobi um, battery-operated hedges. Yeah. Um, but in the pots, we do them by hand. Really? Yeah. So the difference is... Like if you're making a thousand sandwiches and you're spreading the butter and you're putting the stuff on, you're yeah. not doing it with love. But if you're making a sandwich for yourself, you do it properly. Yeah. So in the pot, they're closer to going to a client. So we do them by hand. With how the, how the long does it take you to shape one of them up? 
couple minutes. 30 seconds? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, it's down pat. Yeah. And all the machines in the world, you know, battery operated tools mm. have made life a lot easier than yeah. petrol yeah. and pre-petrol, um, but still the blades are going like this. And so what happens is it cuts the leaf three or four times. Yeah. Where the shears cut it once. Cut it once. So yeah. it's a lot neater. Well, they're very, very well done. Very circular, which I'm guessing is how they're intended. Yep. In ball. <laughs> what were you, a regular Buxus <laughs> oh, yeah, and Casper's brush? I, I was going rectangles for a while, trying to go into competition with you, but I didn't quite work that out. But you've copied me. Um, I've had them patented, actually, the ones you got there. So the we'll pillars? Have, the pillars. We'll have to, yeah. to see in court. But um, otherwise, um, thanks for showing us around. This is so cool. I think um, if people are ever driving past or you're, you're in the market for a Buxus, I think this might be a place worth checking out. Nice little plug. Thanks, thanks Jack. Love you, mate. Love Lawn Solutions.